The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, the new productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Join your channel. What's up, everybody? Welcome to Ask for Candy, 101 Ways to Make Your Love and Life Sweeter. I am Candice Harper, Love Coach. I teach and inspire audacious intimacy to powerful people who want real relationships and shame-free singlehoods. And I always say dating and relationships can be hard, but love, love is always easy. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's another Monday night. Happy Monday, everybody. Hopefully you had a beautiful beginning to your week. Now, for those of you who are listening on your smart device on the TuneIn app, welcome. I'm glad you're here. I just want you to know that I am also live. Live on Facebook. I see my people coming in, so I will be interacting with my people. But I want to interact with you too. Also, those of you who are listening on Armed Radio Global in the garden, honey, listen, you guys can call me. Those of you who are listening and can't see me and aren't on the Facebook, maybe you don't do the Facebook, maybe you don't know how to find me on the Facebook, we got to work that out. But if you're just listening on the radio, maybe you're working, whatever, call me 1 800 508 Five four three one. This is a conversation. So call in if you have things to say. I got a lot of stuff for you guys tonight. So I know that some stuff is going to come up. I don't want you to be shy. But speaking of not being shy, I have all of my loves and my friends are coming in. I see Jen Jacobs. Hi, Candace. She says, hi, boo. It's so good to like see you on here. I think it's the first time and I haven't seen you in years. I see Angela. I see LaShawn. I see Rebecca, my boo. I got your text message. Thank you very much. I love you so much. I'm going to respond after the show is over. I Who else do I see? I see Pamela Nordman, who was my high school gym teacher. By the way, people, see relationships. You got to keep relationships for as long as you can in life, the ones that work. We got Pascal is here. Oh, so many people that I love. Anyway, and those of you who are listening in, I would love for you to call, identify yourselves, say something if you want to say something. I have an action-packed show tonight. I have an information-packed show tonight because, you know, I'm always looking for uh, different things for us to talk about and ruminate over and think about. And I have to say, like, okay, for those of you who are listening on the radio, you don't get to witness, but I'm on Facebook Live. And of course, when you're on Facebook Live, you can see yourself and the camera does a weird thing. I feel like one titty looks bigger. I know that sounds crazy. I know I sound like a nutbag, but whatever. Anyway, we're just going to keep rolling along. (laughs) Tonight, I want to talk about marriage as a choice. But before I do that, for those of you who are brand spanking new, who are listening in, who don't, you know, haven't listened before or don't know me from before, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm Candace Harper, Love Coach. I believe that our purpose is where our talents and our passions meet our challenges. My, one of my big talents clearly is conversation. I love to have a chat. I love to have a, uh, you know, discourse. I love to discuss things back and forth. And I love to just talk and talk and talk. As a matter of fact, when I was a kid, my dad said, if you stop talking, your mouth will not fall off, just so you know that. (laughs) But I didn't believe him, so whatever. I got a podcast. So, talent is conversation, my passion is personal growth, and my purpose, how that comes together, is that I teach and inspire radical self-acceptance for myself and for others so that we can all have our best possible love life. And obviously the challenge has been, how do you figure that out? How do you find that? And so in learning and growing and finding that for myself, finding a great love life with or without a relationship, that is you know, what I want to lead others to come along with me and do. So I teach people how to tap into their inner knowing, their self-acceptance, their ability to create what they want depending on their own individuality, what's true for them, like intuitively on the inside, not what mom and dad said should be true, not what religion says should be true, but what you feel deep down inside that works for you, that gets you connected to what you want and and accepting of it. Because sometimes it's hard for us to accept what's true for us when, you know, everything we've been taught is something different than what we feel. Um, and also I, I believe that being in or out of a relationship is not an expertise. Like I know a lot of people, they're like, 
you know, oh, how are you a love coach if, if you're single? So th the thing about this is that it's like you learn to choose love and happiness over and over again, and you apply it to all of your relationships, whether or not you have a romantic relationship. If you can't do that, you're not going to be happy, single, or in a relationship. So, you know, love coaching and love mastery really has nothing to do with whether you get married or not because you know there's a lot of miserable married people it doesn't you know it's not like you figured out some holy grail it's like how do i know how to choose love and happiness regardless of my relationship status right like that's the key so what i teach is understanding knowing and loving yourself so much that you have faith in your own powers to create whatever it is that you want and each week we have our lively conversation sometimes my facebook people they give some comments and and things like that and the call-in number which did i give you the call-in number it's 1-800 five zero eight five four three one so you can always call in if you're listening on the tune in app or if you're listening in the garden and you can be part of the conversation too um and yeah we talk about different topics relating to love and relationships sometimes i bring on special guests sometimes we play games and do activities always we get a chance to laugh or cry although there hasn't been much crying so far I feel like, you know, the more we interact, the more in depth we get. There's, you know, when I work with my one on one clients, there's always tears. And it's not because I try to make people cry. It's that this is deep stuff. You know, when you start talking about your love life and your past history and what formed your love life, what you believe about love and why you do what you do, sometimes this stuff can get a little, a little rocky, a little, you know, emotionally difficult. But that's what I'm here for, to help support us all through all of that. So, um, you know, I'm not here to hand down a bunch of rules like rights or wrong about love, right, rights or wrongs about love. I don't believe in tips and tricks and methods, and I'm not here to shame whatever your love situation is and whatever you're choosing. My only intention is to get us all into awareness so that we can live a love life that works for us and live it to the absolute fullest. One that is intuitive, intuitively and inherently just for us. Because that's what life is all about. That's what we're here for. So, Facebook people, who else joined in? I still have Jen. Jen, you ha you're going to have to tell me how you're doing and what's going on. We're going to have to have a catch up. Angela, Pascal, you look beautiful. Thank you, my baby love. I love you so much. Thank you for saying that. I'm feeling very booby tonight. I know I've already mentioned my boobs. I don't usually talk about them on the podcast. <laughs> For some reason tonight, I'm very obsessed with them. And I actually wore my big, huge hoops because our, um, our, our head man in charge, Joe, likes big hoops. He told me that the first podcast that I was on, which was What's the Story with Maria, tomorrow night, that's another great podcast. You guys ought to tune in. So anyway, this weekend, I was with my family. And of course, when you're with your family, you're with family of family. So, you know, you, you get some multi layers of personalities you get to meet that you didn't necessarily grow up with or you don't know them, but family just becomes family, right? So I was talking about love and relationships with a family member of a family member. And um, she asked me if I was single. And when I said yes, as often women who feel that marriage is the holy grail of wholeness do, she couldn't wait to console me and share with me her magic trick for becoming a wife, which I thought was very cute. Like she was very instantly like, well, let me tell you what I did to snag my, snag my man. And meanwhile, her man's sitting right there like, you know, I'm happy for her. I think it's great. But clearly, like whatever you did to snag that man or whatever you, however you work that out, sister, you can keep that to yourself. <laughs> Because I'll figure out, you know, something for myself. Anyway, usually I do like these kind of conversations. Like, I want to engage. But this is a family event. So, you know, whatever. It's like, all right, are we really going to go down that road of like, oh, you're single. So let me tell you how to fix it. So, but the thing is, I always learn something interesting about women who do that. So when you say you're single and then instantly they're like, oh, well, you should do this. And you need to do this. And you need to be on this dating site. And you should flirt more. And you should smile more. And, and all of that. You know, they talk about how they snagged a man. And whether it's that they waited patiently until he just finally caved in. Or, you know, they dangled sex like a carrot. Or used some sort of like, I don't know, emotional coercion. It's always these women who are like quick to want to share like their miraculous secrets that, I mean, it's like so transparent. Like I'm dumping all my self-worth in the fact that I was able to drag some dude down the aisle. So now I got to tell you how to do it because it's like, you know, this is the sisterhood. Like you want, the, you want to snag that man. And so I, I 
love her. She's a family member of a fa- of a family member. I and I have no animosity towards her intentions. Like I get it. It's so well meaning. It's not. But it's kind of like if you if someone walked up to you and was like, you know, how much do you weigh? And then you tell them and then they give you unsolicited advice on how to lose weight. It's, you know, it's kind of like it's very assuming. You have to assume a lot about a person to then, you know, tell them how they, you know, what methods and tips and tricks will work for what it is you feel they need. It, you know, it's just not a very connective uh, thing to do. And one thing I find is that women who take a very level-headed approach when it comes to marriage, they don't need to use it as like some sort of hen party trophy. It's not like, oh, you know, look at my husband over here. Here's how I snagged him. And, you know, some women will ask. There are some women out there who, who really feel like getting married is the holy grail. So, like, if they see a married woman, especially at a family event, it's like, oh, well, how did you do it? How did you snag him? How did you lock him down? You know, what is the method for making him marry you? And, you know, women who are level-headed, they don't usually have a method. It's like they were themselves. They are who they are. And then they met someone who aligned and it played out that they got married for better or for worse. And then they just choose it over and over again. It's not some, you know, uh, thing that they manipulated into or some trophy that they won. And they're usually not quick to offer advice for how you do it because they know that it's a very personal individual thing. Like how we find that person that we align with and grow with or don't find that person that we align with or grow with. It's very individual and personal and there's no one size fits all quick tip or trick that's going to have you snag people. But what is that really? It's, that's not true intimate connection. So what I'm all about is how do we get, you know, bo- like even deeper than that and create true intimate connection. I see Joe and Dionis and Evie. Evie Jimenez, I haven't talked to you in so long. She says, hey, Candace, miss you. I miss you too, my beautiful love. Those of you who have just joined know that you are part of this conversation. Feel free to make comments on anything that I'm saying. Um, any of any of what I'm talking about, if something arises for you, I might have some questions coming up. So maybe you guys will, you know, want to answer those questions and talk to me a little bit. Tonight, I have no studio audience. We might do that again, though. I don't know. And tonight, I am partner free as far as, you know, having a conversation on screen. So I'm going to rely on you guys to interact with what we're saying. So that's what we're talking about. Um, So today's topic is about marriage as a choice and also singlehood as a choice. And the fact that often, whether we realize it or not, we are making one choice with our actions and making another choice with our words. For example, like people who are miserable in their relationship and claim that they want to improve it or leave it. But year after year, they stay in the hopes that something will change in that other person or that there'll be something that they can do to make that person be different in order for the relationship to work. That is like, you know, my my words, which say I want this great relationship are one thing, but my actions are I'm going to fix this other person to make this great relationship. And that's out of alignment. If I say that I want the great relationship, I got to be bringing the great relationship. I got to be doing the things or, or, or being the things that are what I say I want. It doesn't work to try to make the other person be it or to complain about that other person or to try to talk them into it or force it. It just doesn't work. On the other side of that, single people who claim they want to be married, but they don't allow any partnership or contribution in their lives. Like just, you know, they don't want to hear from other people. They don't let people help them. They don't ask for help. They get stuck in their ways of doing things and they don't truly want to compromise too much. And also a lot of times people who are single and say they want a relationship, they set the the bar so high, like these unreachable standards. So those are just a couple of ways that we make a choice with what we do and um, say something different. And, And it's the taking responsibility for that choice. Like, I'm living like a single girl and I'm doing all the things that support a single life, but I'm saying that I want to be married and it just, it's not happening year after year because it's out of alignment and it doesn't work. So here's what I did. I found this article. Let me see. 
It was at PurposeFairy.com. Oh, hey, La Liz joined. I don't know if you guys remember La Liz from a couple episodes ago. Hi, my love. She says, hey, Candice. And I see Joe Artizon, amazing, talented Joe. And who else is here? I see Dar, who I haven't seen in a very, very long time. Evie says, have you heard of Esther Perel? I absolutely love her. And her take on infidelity. Sometimes I feel like humans aren't supposed to be monogamous. Yes, I said it. <laughs> I love that, Evie, because what you're speaking to is this idea. I mean, I don't remember her take on it. I did watch like a YouTube video with Esther Perel, who I love. I love her French accent. Um, but what you're speaking to is like the science of human sexuality and human interaction as opposed to, you know, this this idea of traditional marriage, which is, you know, very religion based, which there's nothing wrong with that. If you're religious and that's important to you, absolutely nothing wrong with it. But, you know, when we look at all aspects of humanity and science and biology and, you know, how that all works, there is something to be said for maybe we're not completely built to be monogamous, but more so trained and nurtured into thinking that that's what works. Now, there's exceptions to every rule, right? So you have these great marriages that go on for decades and even they can't tell you what the magic trick is to having your your marriage last and having it work i mean there's people who are like in church every sunday and devout and they still end up divorced because there is no magic trick to it it's not about um you know some sort of like thing that you can do that you know that forces someone to stay with you or whatever it's really just about like who you are being and aligning what you say you want with what you do what, what i was talking about before so i found this great article purposefairy.com and it's called 15 things you should give up to make your marriage work <laughs> which totally like that title contradicts with what i'm saying right that you can't somehow make your marriage work but i think in the spirit that she means it is that you know what can you what can you release so that you can have a workable relationship but here's the thing everything that she says in these 15 things which i'm going to share with you everything she says works for anything like it works for singlehood. It works for if you want to get a new job, if you want to create a project or understand your purpose, understand who you are in the world. I'm going to share with you these 15 things and we're going to talk about them and you'll see it all like it all meshes together. <laughs> it all works for all of it. You know, she's applying it to to marriage, but you know, when I'm going through these things, I want you to apply it to whatever you are trying to make work. And if what you are trying to make work right now is a singlehood, then think in terms of that. And don't, here's the thing, single people. I don't want you to be afraid of, of being in acceptance and in love of, with being single. Because a lot of times I think that people who've been single for a long time, they think if I get too used to it or if I get too, if I start to like it too much, that I'm not going to be able to change it. But it's quite the opposite. As long as you are unhappy single, you're going to be unhappy in a relationship, assuming you find a relationship from an unhappy singlehood. It happens. I've done it. But I didn't get a happy relationship out of it. So you know, the key here is... To develop that that relationship with yourself and just like if you're in a, if you were in a marriage you'd want to develop your relationship with yourself first what are you bringing what are you generating what are you expressing what are you sharing that's what it's all about so here are the 15 things that she says to give up if you want to make a marriage work if you want to make I say if you want to make a singlehood work if you want to make anything work so the first one is give up your unrealistic expectations. She says, um, give up all your unrealistic expectations about marriage, like being in this beautiful box full of all the things that you've always longed for and just see marriage for what it truly is. So substitute that with singlehood, substitute that with, you know, uh, changing careers, like just see it, see it for what it is. And so she says that it's an empty box where you or, and your partner must put all the things that you want to take out Everything is like that. Everything that you choose to do, if you approach it like it's an empty box that you have to contribute to, that you have to put into in order to make it work, that's how you get out of it what you what you want to get out of it. Not by just expecting, expecting it to be given to you and expecting it to come to you and demanding it and trying to find ways to manipulate it. It's 
put it in there. <laughs> if you want a relationship to be happy, you want a singlehood to be happy, if you want a situation, whatever it is, a project to be a fun project, it's totally 100% up to us to to bring that, to generate that, to put that in there. Brandon, I see Brandon just arrived on Facebook Live. Hi, Brandon. He says, hey, sexy. Hey, sexy. Hey. <laughs> anyway, I love flirting. That's one thing you you can also me too. If you want to call one eight hundred five zero eight five four three one, you can call just to flirt. I don't mind. I don't mind that either. I like the conversation. So, then number two, she says, give up control, which I find very very interesting. She says, people who people are made to be loved, not controlled. The more you try to control your partner, the more you will push him or her away from you and the less love there will be between you you two. And that I absolutely do believe. I also believe that if we're talking about our singlehoods, when we try to control everything and we try to like, you know, be really tight on the reins of not being able to sort of go with the flow of things, um, you know, whether it's our dating lives or just being open to, you know, where and how you can meet people. Um, you know, whatever you're talking about, it's like it's fluidity. We're not willing to like uh, be somewhat flexible in life in general, no matter what we're doing. It's like a con we're in constant resistance. It's like you're basically fighting up against life. And it just, oof. I mean, for any of you out there who've ever been, and I have, in, in a state of overwhelm or, you know, if you're in a relationship feeling like you're just doing so much and it's just, it's getting you nowhere or that it's like, you know, I don't know, you're ready to give up and you're martyring yourself like, oh, I do everything and no one does anything. Like if you've ever said that to yourself or felt in that state, it's because you have not given up control. You are trying so hard to fight against what the flow is and what life is bringing and, you know, the ability to just be in acceptance of that and roll with it. And even love it, even if it's not what you wanted. Things don't always work out how we expect. But being able to like roll with the flow of life, the flow of a relationship, the flow of your singlehood is is the the key to like having ease and happiness and you know whatever else you want to create. Um, and also those of you who are listening and on Facebook, if you want to say anything about giving up control, because that's this is one of my favorite ones because it's one of the ones that I always have a hard time with giving up control. It, I think it speaks to, I had a great conversation um, with Rebecca, who's on the thread, who I absolutely love and adore. And we were talking about like control and trust and, you know, being able to trust people and trusting people is important whether or not you're in a relationship, because when you're not in a relationship and you want one, you're basically practicing with everybody that you deal with. Right. Or, you know, everybody that you that you date, you're you know, there's a level of practicing. It takes a huge amount of trust to allow yourself to truly connect with someone. It takes a huge amount of trust to be happily in a marriage with someone. There's a lot of marriages where there is no trust and they don't work. Right. But not being able to give up control is a sign that you do not trust. So, you know, I like that. Give up control. The next one she says is give up possessiveness. She says, no matter how long you two have been together and no matter if you are married and have 10 children together or not, you do not possess your partner. He or she is not property. You are both separate entities. And just as you are separate from him, uh, so is she separate from you? Give up possessiveness and allow your partner to breathe. Give him or her space and freedom they tr that they truly deserve and watch how much more your beautiful your relationship becomes. Now, give up possessiveness. Believe it or not, that is also universal when it comes to singlehood and, you know, pursuing something, purpose, career, whatever it is. Because we have this thing where we decide that we want something and we attach ourselves to it. We feel like it's ours and it can be very limiting because it, it speaks back to fluidity and being able to go with the flow of life. It's a very scary thing, especially for people who are extremely type A and like to put all their ducks in a row and, you know, make sure that things are uh, controlled and in a certain way and that they are, you know, singularly their vision. And a lot of us have really great visions, but to think that um, we be we would be able to be in partnership with one or to work with many and singularly have our own vision 
is it's just not workable you know for anything that we want to do that's major and you know having a relationship work is major having um you know a partnership a work partnership work is major having a great single life and being in great relationship with yourself is major and the reason that it's major is because a lot of us don't fully understand that it's not always about our singular vision and you know what we possess and control so it's worthwhile to consider this the giving up of possessiveness and that's not even talking about like jealousy and insecurity and how that doesn't work I think she talks about that a little bit, but we can't we can't read all of every one of them. We'll be here all night. I wish we could be here all night because I love being with you guys. I see Julie and Robert joined. Hi, you guys. It's so great to have you here. If you're listening on um, TuneIn or if you're in the garden, call me 1-800-508-5431. I have my trusty phone here. I'm thinking about getting an upgrade. I have my trusty phone here. Call me and we'll talk about it. What I'm going through right now, for those of you who have just joined, I'm going through um, an article from PurposeFairy.com. And the writer of it, I think her name is Luminita. Luminita, which means light, I believe. And she's giving us some light and a little bit of wisdom about the 15 things we need to give up to make marriage work. And I am inviting everyone to apply it to... Whatever, they, whatever they're trying to make work, whether it be singlehood or whatever. And you know what? My name also means light. So between me and Luminita, even though she's, you know, she doesn't know it, we're working together to offer you guys some light, to offer all of us some light because we all need it. So number four says to give up criticism. Woo, honey, that's a hard one. I think I wrote a meme one time that said, if you, if you couldn't criticize, would you have anything to talk about? <gasps> I don't know. For some people, I feel like they wouldn't. See, Evie, she says, that's a hard one, right? Give up criticism. I mean, that means, like, all of these sort of tie together. Because part of um, control and part of possessiveness, all of that is about, and unrealistic expectations. Like criticism is sort of the tool that we use in order to express those things. Like if I want to express possession over you, or if I want to control you, or if I want you um, to meet my expectations, if I'm you know, not aware of what I'm doing, which most of us are not, we just interact with our partner trying to make them do what we want. Criticism is usually a go-to. I mean, we talk about it all the time, right? And sometimes it can get very abusive, but both men and women fall into that trap of like, you know, you're not a man, you can't do this, you didn't do that. And then the more unsatisfied we get, it's even more insults, more criticism. Why'd you do that that way? Why'd you do that this way? You should have done this instead of that. You know, we do it to each other and it's just, it's, it doesn't work. And when you're single and you're a criticizer because your standards are so high or whatever, you're using it to sort of mask all of your uh, defenses, all of the walls we put up to protect our vulnerability. It's like, oh, he didn't wear the right shoes to the date or, you know, she had spinach in her teeth or, you know, it's like, yeah, it doesn't work. The criticism. I agree with Luminita. You got to give up the criticism to make anything work. Your marriage, your dating life, and if you want to just find your purpose, like the self-criticism, like how am I going to stop just like looking for the negative things and focusing in on those negative things and thinking that those negative things are what make things work. Because those like focusing in on the negative does not make anything work. It just brings more of the negative. You know, but focusing in on what is working, you get to, you know, have it grow. So, yeah, giving up criticism, I like. And she put a a quote by Billy Corgan, compliments and criticism are all ultimately based on some form of projection. That is so true because, you know, harsh judges, harsh criticizers, like you think, especially if you know one and, and you talk to one, like whatever language they're using to talk about other people or talk about what's wrong with other people and other things, it, trust me, it's like, and I was one of those people, 
it's like a fraction compared to you know what they're saying to themselves or how hard they are on themselves so that it is it's like i i project it onto you like i'm unable to do these things i don't believe that you would be able so i'm gonna and parents do that a lot obviously otherwise you know a lot of us we wouldn't be so unbalanced <laughs> We weren't raised with criticism, but it just, you know, it doesn't work. It doesn't work for marriage or singlehood. Luminita also says that you have to give up the need to fix your partner. And how does that also apply to singlehood? Well, like give up the need to fix and uh, that it's something external of you that needs to be fixed. And this, this does apply to anything. If something doesn't work for you, it's about bringing what works, bring the love, the caring, the support, the, you know, uh, whatever you think there needs to be more of. It's not about the fixing of it. And even people who are aware of that and will say, I know I can't change him. They will still keep banging their head against the wall in resistance and complaint about the fact that their their person hasn't changed or if they're single they will beat their head against the wall about the fact that their singlehood hasn't changed or that it's you know they'd rather it be something else so there's this really great quote by albert einstein that she put in here men marry women with the hopes they will never change and women marry men with the hope that they will change and invariably they are both disappointed so you know no matter what if there's this I got to fix this. I got to fix you. I got to change something external in order for myself to be fulfilled or to be happier to have this work. That's where you, you run up against the wall. And, you know, you can keep banging your head if you want to. But I agree with Miss Luminita that that's definitely something that you just want to release. I don't need to fix you. If you're not aligned and you don't work with who I am and how I am, I can just release you and let you go. And, you know, and I know that's not always the easiest thing. My last relationship, I was very attached. I very much wanted to fix him. He very much wanted to fix me. And it was an, that attachment kind of love. And the ending of that love was just very difficult and very challenging because we, we hang our hopes on it and we think that we can make it work. And once we're in that state, it's like, Sometimes it takes a miracle to tear away. Sometimes people stay in it for years. So what's another one? Luminita says to give up your jealous behavior, which I, I mean, not, that's obvious for a marriage. It's obvious for a dating life. It's such a sign of insecurity, the jealousy thing. It's like, if it's also negating the fact that you are an individual. And it also goes back to trust. Like if you're with someone and... You know, you have a, a, a established relationship with them. You know, it's like, do you make the decision to trust that they love you for you if you're allowing them to see you and know you? Or do you hang on to this idea that someone else is going to be able to take them and uh, feel jealous and insecure? The quote here is, a competent and self-confident person is incapable of jealousy in anything. Jealousy is invariably a symptom of neurotic insecurity. And that's by Robert Heinlein. I mean, there's no two ways about it. We've all been there. Like, we've all had our moments of jealousy. But if you are honest with yourself and loving of yourself and caring of yourself, you realize that there's only one you. There's only one you. And if that person that you're with wants to be with somebody else or is trying to be with someone else, like jealousy doesn't serve you. Jealousy, what jealousy says is I, I agree with you feeling that I'm inferior or I assume you feel I, I'm inferior and that someone else is better. And I agree with it so that I'm going to, to fight it. I'm going to resist it. I'm going to you know, do whatever jealous people do in order to like fight this thing. And it's just doesn't work doesn't work if you want to have a happy marriage a happy singlehood it doesn't work it's you know it's really just about self-confidence and self-trust this this hour just whizzes by it's like already 8 37 and i want to spend the whole night with you guys i see um my uncle calvin joined and hiam is here hi hiam and what did you say julie you have always lit up a room oh honey i love you too i don't know if you're talking about my lovely uh uh recessed lighting <laughs> or just me but i thank you my love um so let's see what else does lumi need to say she says give up on your fears 
What do you guys think about that one? Like, give up on your fears. The fears is a hard one because I believe that we all have them. I mean, I definitely, to this day, even as a coach, even in doing all of this self-improvement work and stuff like that, I feel like fears are a big part of it. I deal with them on a regular basis. And even in considering getting into a relationship with a new person, I have a lot of fear around that. So what's Julie say? Harder to live by when you find out they had a long affair scary. I totally get that, Julie. I think you're right. Like if you, this goes back to, I think she's talking about the um, giving up your jealous behavior. Absolutely, honey. Especially if you, you have proof that someone has cheated on you, been with someone else, especially if you've already built a life with them or you have kids with them or whatever. Like I don't want to um, invalidate that or negate that or anything like that. But the way out of it, the way out of that maze is like, how do I turn inward and, you know, get into a place with myself where, uh, you know, and here's the thing, this is not to judge whether you should or should not forgive someone if they've cheated on you or be with someone or not be with someone if they've cheated on you. But whether you stay with that person or not, at some point, um, it, it's how do I get into a relationship with myself where I... I don't have to pretend to trust that person, but I trust that what that person is bringing into the relationship, oh, your personal, thank you, Julie. <laughs> Julie says my personality is bright. Thank you. I trust that, um, like, I'm in alignment with what it is that I, I say I want for myself, and I'm bringing what I say I want for myself. And when I am someone who means you ill, now here's the thing, I don't want to overcomplicate this. But someone who cheats on you doesn't necessarily mean you ill. Because when people do things like that, it's about them. It's about whatever it is they, they're telling themselves, whatever story they're saying they're missing. It's about them not knowing how to bring what it is they want in the relationship or what they want to happen. It's totally about their, uh, their insecurities. It's, um, it has nothing to do with you or, or an inability to communicate with you, to work that out. So at some point, and this is easier for, for some than others, and it all depends on the, the gravity of the situation and the level of relationship that you have, at some point, the way to heal that and to be someone who doesn't need to be jealous is to go inward and say, you know, how do I learn to have such love and confidence in myself that not only do I not attract people who are in their own insecure story, who would be willing to cheat over working it out, but that I also um, enter into the relationship with a trust that, that inspires more trust. And I don't know if you guys have listened to shows in the past where I've talked about when we enter a relationship with fears and no trust, a lot of times that's what we cultivate in the relationship. So then nobody can trust anybody and then it all breaks down. So what do you say, Julie? Agreed. Just hard for a pleasing personality. And yes, you are right. Yeah, I get it. I totally get it. And you know, it's no one said this stuff is easy. <laughs> and I think what makes it makes it challenging is that, um, you know, and I don't know if it's a cultural thing without knowing how other people in other cultures grow up. I think that culturally we are taught that there's something outside of us that has to be right for us to be okay. Whether it's that our partner has to be a certain way, our, you know, uh, work situation has to be a certain way. It's like when things turn out not right. And I noticed myself doing this today because today I had a hell of a day. Like, um, you know, I, I got a t a parking ticket. It's one of those days where like everything, but a parking ticket, I, you know, my phone got shut off. I had like a million things, you know, the, my, uh, six year old that I sometimes take care of got sick. And so I had to go get her from school, like a million things. And you're like, you can get caught up in a moment where so many things are going on and not going your way and start to feel like if the external is not working, life is not working and I cannot be happy. But what we don't get is that until we can generate it from the inside, it's not, it doesn't come to you. And even if it does, you can't recognize it and it still doesn't fulfill you. It's like people who are like, oh, I got to get rich. I got to get rich. I got to get rich. And then they get rich and it's like, eh, well, now I need something else because it totally has to come from the inside.
And now I'm on this total like tangent. I've, I've left Luminita's article, which I thought we might do because there's always so much to talk about and so many layers to all of this stuff. I see Trav, Trav Hall join. What's up, Trav? I haven't seen you in forever. Trav, I believe, was an intern when I was on the Wendy Show. I used to be the art director of the Wendy Show years ago. And there it, there it is from inside. Yes, absolutely, Julie says. So, you know what, folks? We've got so much to still go through, and we have so little time. But I want us to try to, like, pound through this. And I love, Julie, I love that you're interacting with me on this. And, you know, if you ever want to talk on the side, we can definitely do that, too, because this is a, always an ongoing conversation. And healing is always an ongoing conversation. And understanding ourselves in, in a way that we can be happy no matter what, that's the key here. It's not or whatever, but how do we learn how to generate our own happiness so that we can bring something to relationships, that we can be a contributor and we can attract other contributors and they do exist. Like there are people out there who actually know how to generate their own good feelings and their own happiness and know how to create that with other people. And that is what we are all about. 101 ways to make life sweeter, right? All right. So number eight, she says, is give up the chase for perfection. I love this one because I used to be such a perfectionist. I wouldn't even be doing this podcast if this was five years ago, the perfectionist that I was because it would have been all about like getting it right, having a perfect high definition camera, for the Facebook Live, it would have been like, you know, I don't know, a million, is my hair right? Or do I have the right outfits? Or, you know, and on some level, I still like to get it a certain to a certain standard, but it's like, I do what I do and I show up. And that, you know, my idea here is to show up no matter what. This weekend, unfortunately, I had a family funeral. My niece passed away. It was, you know, it was a tough weekend, but I knew over the course of the weekend, I was like, I have certain commitments and this is one of them. I'm going to show up. I'm not going to let my perfectionism get in the way. So I'm not going to say, well, because I was sad this weekend and I'm not going to be able to do things as, as, you know, be as prepared as I usually am or, you know, sit down and really do a rundown for this podcast. So let me, you know, my past self would have said, let me not do it. And the same thing applies to our relationships. Like if you have this thing where everything has to be perfect, that person has to do things a perfect way, be perfect. If you're single and you feel like every date has to be perfect, whatever perfect is, perfect doesn't exist and it's a construct. We don't even know what the rules are. It's like, you know, we make up this thing in our mind based on movies we've seen, you know, what our parents told us, whatever, about what our relationship is supposed to look like what our dating is supposed to look like, what our singlehood, you know, when we're not dating is supposed to look like. And then if it doesn't match up, then we're upset about it. You know, we're seeing it from this imperfect context and it's wrong. And then that everything is cyclical. It all speaks back to the same stuff. So we're trying to make it perfect. You go back and yeah, (laughs) it's all, it's basically all the same thing over and over again. Right. Like trying to make it be this thing because it's we're focusing on the external and not on the internal. And it's all about the internal. Like you can generate happiness at the drop of a hat. You can generate joy at the drop of a hat. You can generate ease. You know, we so many of us with stress and stress in our relationships, stress in our jobs, stress in what we do, you know, if something goes wrong and then all of a sudden it's like it all falls apart. And then it starts to fall apart in our bodies and we start to get sick. And as we get older, heart attacks and things like that, all of that stuff can be prevented by the, just the willingness to create something else for ourselves and not wait for the world to do it and not wait for the external to change. Uh, number nine, she says to give up on blame. Oh, actually, let me tell you this quote, because in the, uh, giving up the chase for perfection. She put a quote by Donald Miller that says, when you stop expecting people to be perfect, you can like them for who they are. I love that quote. And I'll tell you why. Because here's the thing. It not just like people for who they are, like yourself for who you are. That's the only way that you'll, you'll ever generate love is like, it's this acceptance. Except if I can't accept myself, I definitely can't accept other people. But, you know, that's definitely the holy grail. Like, 
I like you for who you are. I like myself for who I am. All the good, all the bad, all the right, all the wrong, you know, everything you are and everything you aren't, I choose to like you. I generate it. I generate the liking. Anyway, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to like sledgehammer this over your head. I'm not trying to pound it into you. Actually, I am, but you know, and I know I'm a little bit repetitive with it, but I do feel like it's really important. And I do feel like it's, you know, one of the biggest challenges of life is just this understanding that it's totally, it's all internal stuff, all just internal stuff. So number nine, she says, is give up on the blame. She says, believe it or not, it's not the other person's job to make you feel all the things that you yourself can't feel on your own. It's not the other person's job to make you feel loved. I know that sounds bad shit. I don't know if I'm allowed to say that. Crazy. But we get into these relationships or we're in our singlehood and we're trying to find a relationship. And sometimes we cognitively know this to be true, but it is not the other person's job to make you feel loved. And if you don't already feel it for yourself, no one can do it. If you haven't haven't generated if you haven't generated that for yourself or created that for yourself, no one can can do it for you. You know, we just can't. And I think that's a lot of times why. Do you know I read a st- statistic? I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. That 50.2 percent of Americans are single. Which means it's, you know, just a little bit, but tipping that half of the population is now single, which is the first time in history that's been the case. But, you know, and the reason for that is because obviously the high divorce rate and a lot of people not deciding to get married until a lot later and a lot of people not deciding to get married at all. But I also think a lot lot of the reason these relationships don't work out and why she lists all these other things is because it truly is all about this you know, thinking that it's someone else's job to make us feel loved. And it's just not like we, you know, we are, and I, I say it at the end of the show every time, we are love making machines. And when we need it and we want it, we just can make more. <laughs> we can be more loving if that's what you want. And a lot of times we just don't get that. And so we end up dissatisfied, our expectations not being met, criticizing all these other things she talked about, feeling a need to fix that other person because they're not showing us enough love, you know, fearful, trying to be a perfectionist. All of that stuff comes out of feeling that it's someone else's responsibility to make me feel love or make me feel loved. You know, and if I've dragged some dude down the aisle and I've made it happen, I've manipulated, I'm all proud of myself because I think I've accomplished something when really, in fact, it it all it was always about, you know, what my relationship was with myself or is or continues to be. You know, I don't know. We'll see. It all remains to be seen, right? Number ten, she says, give up the need to always be right. I love that one. Yeah. Like always needing to win the argument. Obviously, that's for marriage. And also in singlehood. It's like, you know, you'll meet people all the time and they'll disagree with you, come from different cultures, have different things to say. And the need to always be right is also sometimes just, you know, feeling like we already know everything, especially as we get older. It's like the, you know, the trick of wisdom. Oh, I already know everything. I've already experienced so many years of life. There's nothing you can tell me. I'm right about what I know. And, you know, that's it. So that one's pretty self-explanatory. Give up living your life according to the other person's expectations. Definitely, that's totally codependency. And I don't know how that necessarily applies to singlehood, but if you feel it, use it. Um, let's see. There's nothing less attractive than a person who clings to his or her partner, expecting the other person to provide all their emotional, physical, and spiritual needs. See, it's repetitive. It's repetitive stuff because it's true. It's all true. Give up your emotional baggage. Obviously, that one is challenging. It takes some work. It takes some willingness. Um, Give up asking for more than you give or thinking that, you know, oh, if you give a little, I've given enough. I've had people say that. I've given enough. It's like, okay, so is this where the relationship ends? (laughs) I've given enough. Okay. All right. And that's it. I guess it's over. And then give up attachment. She says there's a huge difference between love and attachment. And what most people call love is nothing more than attachment. It comes from fear. While love is pure, kind, and selfless. That's why I say dating and relationships can be hard. But love is easy. Because in dating and relationships, a lot of times what we approach with is this attachment. Like fearful, possessive, 
Um, you know, I own you. I'm jealous. I don't want you doing anything uh, without me. All of that stuff. I've got to control you. Um, she's saying, Luminata is saying, give up that. And she puts a quote from Deepak Chopra. Love allows your beloved the freedom to be unlike you, which I love that. Attachment asks for conformity to your needs and desires. Love imposes no demands. Attachment expresses an overwhelming demand. Make me feel whole. Love expands beyond the limits of two people. Attachment tries to exclude everything but two people. And so those are the 15 things that Luminata says will make a marriage work. Hopefully, as you were listening along, you were listening for how, you know, if you're single, how it will make your singlehood work. Hopefully you were listening for how it can make anything that you want to create in life work. Ultimately, what I want to want you to walk away with is just the knowledge that It's all about you and your choice and your alignment with what it is you say you want. Line up the actions with what you say you want. Take inspired action based on what you say you want. If you're not, maybe say you want the other thing. Like for me, as you know, as a single person for the longest time, I was like, oh, you know, I want to be in a relationship. I want to be in a relationship. But my actions were not in alignment with wanting to be in a relationship. I, you know, I was very controlling. I was not interested in any sort of partnership, any sort of like collaboration in my life or, you know, making any sort of changes in how I did things in my schedule and stuff like that. I wanted a person who fit into my life. And so, you know, it don't work like that. <laughs> I know that's very articulate and prolific. It don't work like that. Um, but that's it. Yeah, those are the 15 things. If you guys want to, you know, I'll, I'll send the link to this article if you want to check it full, fully out for yourself from Miss Luminata. Also, we're running low on time. Ah, there's never enough time. And I want to give you the, the three ways. I always give you guys the three ways to make love and life even sweeter. And here are the three ways. Number one is to make a choice. You're either going to rock singlehood or have an amazing marriage. Pick one and commit to it. So however you want to rock singlehood, like if it means dating, if it means not dating, if it means dating yourself, pick it, choose it, and live into it 100%. And then be fluid with what life brings based on that. Just be 100% in, in it. And see what happens. See what shows up. If you're in a marriage and you want to have an amazing marriage, choose marriage. Stop thinking about what it would be like to be single. What if you had made a different decision? How can you change what this is? Accept what it is for everything it is. Everything it's not. Choose it, choose it, choose it. And um, and just commit to it. Commit to generating everything that you want to generate in it. I know I'm making it sound like, oh, it's so easy. I know it's not easy. But this is why... We do a podcast about it so we can be in a conversation about it and support each other as a community. And, you know, you guys can always reach out. Um, you can always email me at um, askforcandypodcast at gmail.com. You can always private message me here on Facebook. You can join the Creative Love Collective. You can join Armed Radio Group News and find me and get me that way. Um, and then the second thing for the three ways to make love and life sweeter is give someone some support. Look, you know, even if it's just words of encouragement, something they can use, you know, give somebody, especially if you're one of the people who, uh, for whom the criticism uh, release really resonated. If criticism has been your thing, find someone that you've been criticizing a lot and give them a little bit of support this week. We're going to make love and life a little sweeter. And then the third one is if you don't already have it, and even if you do, find a community that you love. Like I have a women's workshop that I work with off and on. Not as much right now because it's Monday nights and I'm here on Monday night. But, you know, it's a community that I love and it came around exactly when I needed it. So whether it's a writing community or a creative community or, you know, emotional support community, whatever it might be, find one this week. Let's see. What did you say, Evie? I'm six years in and pick it. It's a lot of work, but totally worth it. Yes. Six years into your relationship. You go, girl. That's what I'm talking about. You got to just choose it. I'm in it. Right? So now, uh, I just feel like we just rushed through. And, you know, I just, I wish we had three hours. I could just keep talking to you all night long. And I love it when you guys, that you guys are responding. And, um, 
you know, that you're engaged. And those of you on the TuneIn app, those of you in the garden, hopefully you are getting some value out of this. I would absolutely, you know, just love to know. You're welcome to reach out to me and let me know. But the sign-off question of the night and what I want you to also take with you this week, which I will hold you accountable for for next week, what am I releasing this week to make blank work? So if it's marriage, singlehood, uh, my career, my job search, um, this new project that I want to do, whatever it is, uh, what am I releasing this week to make blank work? Now, if you need the 15 things that we said to re- you know refer to them and see if one of those work for you, just let me know. I'll send it to you or I'll send you the link. I might post the link on the Facebook Live. Um, but I want you to think about this over the over the week. What do I have to release? Do I have to release control, perfectionism? Do I have to release, um, what are some of the other ones? I didn't memorize them, y'all. I'm just reading. Do I have to release attachment? Do I have an emotional baggage that I have to release? Uh, living life according to other people's expectations? Are those things that I need to release? I want you guys to consider that this week and see what it is. Julie says, release anger. I love it. Absolutely love it. Absolutely. So Julie, you need to reach out to me so we can have like a private conversation and talk about what that means. Releasing anger. Uh, We got 40 seconds because it just goes so fast. So as always, until next time, never forget you are a love machine. If you ever start to feel like you aren't getting the love you need, just make more, honey. Just make more. We all have the ability. We all are a field of possibilities. We are all capable as human beings. And there's just no reason why you can't have a happy, sweet love life, a happy, sweet life. And yeah, that's it. As for Candy, Julie says, thank you. Evie says, thank you, Candice. Love is all. Thank you, honey. I'm glad that you were here. I'm glad for all of you that were here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being on TuneIn. Thank you for